One thing I really love about the internet is that there are communities for anything you can imagine. And I'm so fascinated by people completely nerding out over something weird. For example, the 1997 video game Frogger. There are people who still spend their time in 2020 on this game. And I love it. So today we are going to explore a weird data compression algorithm used within this game. Before we go very technical, let's just learn more about Frogger. Kneesnap, the master hopper of the Highway Frogs forum, contacted me quite a while ago and asked if I would be interested in making a video about his work on a tool called Froglord and Frogger in general. Like I said, I find the stuff always very fascinating, so we jumped on a call and he showed me stuff. So this is Frogger. As you can see, a very old game. You are playing as a frog and you have to get through the level without dying, hopping around and evading enemies and obstacles. Quite a trivial game with typical old school 3D graphics. Kneesnap has quite a lot of nostalgia for this game. As you can see, the camera is very close to the frog and doesn't reveal much about the whole level. He told me that when he was a kid, the game always felt mysterious. These levels seemed so large, but it was difficult to explore the maps because there was a very strict timer. I can totally relate to the sense of wonder from the games of our childhood. In fact, I will have some videos coming out about a game from my childhood soon. Anyway, so Kneesnap got motivated to work on this tool called Froglord. It's a modding tool. It allows you to open the game files and explore them and even make modifications. This is how the Frogger folder structure looks like. The exe obviously has the code, but the important file containing the assets of the game is this mwd file. They don't even know what exactly the name of this file type is. They assume it's called medieval wad or millennium wad. Kneesnap explained to me that this is a very old file format. It was designed for CDs. CDs are split up in multiple sectors, and so this file format makes sure to align different parts of it to the sector boundaries. That's why there's a lot of empty data areas until the next section begins. This makes reading from the CD more efficient. So in there must be all the different assets used by the game. And so this file contains multiple files. And it's quite easy to know where the single files start and end because they start at those boundaries and have all this padding to the next section. But these embedded files have again their own format. At the start of a file, you typically find some information about the file type. This is referred to as the file magic. And so this file, for example, has a signature PP20, followed by a lot of gibberish. Gibberish data can hint at two things. It could be encrypted or it could be compressed. So we have here an indication that this is a compressed file. And actually, when Kneesnap started with FrogTool, there existed already a tool that could decompress this data. The tool is called QuickBMS by Aloigi. QuickBMS supports tons of games and file formats, archives, encryptions, compressions, obfuscations, and other algorithms. It's an advanced tool for reverse engineers. In case you wonder how could one figure this compression in the first place, well, there are a few options. Maybe you just know it because you worked in that kind of industry. Maybe you find stuff documented online about PP20, or you sit down and do the very laborious work of debugging and reverse engineering the game itself when it loads this data. The compression algorithm must be included in the Frogger game, right? So this is already cool. There were tools to decompress the data assets from Frogger and you could explore them. Now the files you get after decompressing it might also be another custom file format and you need to figure that one out, but you're one step closer. So let's learn a bit more about this file compression. Kneesnap explained some basics to me. So PP20 is the magic that you can check and be sure, yep, this is my compressed file. And then the following data contains some metadata. And all the way at the end of the file, three of the last four bytes is the uncompressed file size. So you can already allocate the size needed for the decompressed file. And this byte, the hex 1f, means you need to skip 31 bits backwards. The whole decompression works kind of from the end of the file. You see very weird stuff. However, that's only decompression. What if you would want to modify some assets and then compress it again? 
So based on the decompression algorithm, you could reverse engineer what the compression algorithm does. But it turns out that actually this compression algorithm seemed to have been used in the Amiga community. This compression algorithm is called PowerPacker 2.0, PP20. It's made by some guy in like 1989. And Nisnap actually found the original compression tool, but he has no clue how to run it. It's a compiled library for the Amiga. So it's kind of interesting that such an old compression algorithm, remember it came out in 1989 for the Amiga, was supported for a few years, now shows up in 1997 in the Frogger game. So it's speculation, but it could be that the Frogger developer used to work with Amiga and knew it from there. I find this fascinating. But anyway, in general, this compression algorithm seems to be based on LZSS. Lempel, Ziff, Stora, Szymanski, LZSS is a lossless data compression algorithm. And Wikipedia roughly shows how it works. Let's say you want to compress this text. You can see it has some repeating patterns. And those you can reference. So in the compressed text, you encode offset and length instead of having the actual text itself. So when you decompress this file, you read in this data, reach this reference, and it says, please go to the fifth character and take three bytes, and then please go to the start and take four bytes. This is very simple, but has an interesting property. A file without any references is still a valid compressed file, and the decompressor could read it. It would just not do anything. It also means the work and efficiency of the compression relies on the compress algorithm because depending on what it chooses to reference or not choose, it does good compression or bad compression. It could be very fast or very slow. So if you are very lazy, you don't really have to do much to compress a file. Just keep it uncompressed and wrap it in the metadata information from PP20. But obviously that is less cool than developing an actual compression algorithm. Also, you might need it to fit the data into the smaller CD format. So let's check out how the decompression works in a bit more detail. I think it's a neat introduction to how data compression works. I think with that you can develop some intuition for it. First I'm using IntelliJ to clone the frog tool repository and follow the setup steps. Also I had to install the Java 1.8 SDK and install the Lombok plugin. Then I was able to build the project. But we are only interested in the PP20 packer and unpacker, so we can create a new minimal main. Here's a simple hello world. And in the build configuration, I create my own one that launches our new main. Testing running it, and it prints hello world. Great. Now we can simply access the frog tool classes PP20 packer and unpacker. I also added a basic hex dump and binary dump so we can look at the actual data. And this works now. We can compress a string with pack data and decompress it with unpack data. Next, I'm adding some debug output in various places of the PP20 unpacker class. This way, we can easily follow what happens during decompression. Let's start simple. Let's compress the single letter A and then unpack it again. Here's the output we see. This is the compressed data in hex, and this is the same data in binary. In this output, I have removed the first four bytes. The first bytes would be the magic file string pp20, but it's not part of the actual decompression, so I removed it. Now, let's see what happens. Let's head into unpack. As mentioned earlier, the decompression starts from the back, so here it reads the last byte. Apparently, bits to skip, but the last byte is zero, so nothing to skip. Then we get the decoded data size, which is taken from the next three bytes from the end. And you can see those three bytes are a one. So the output length is one, which will be the single A. This also means max file size you can compress with this is hex FFFFF, so 16 megabytes. If we had bits to skip, we would skip them here, but it was zero. So at this point, we processed all of those bytes and our bit reader is currently here. Now we decode the segment. It reads the next bit and checks if it's zero. If it's zero, it's an indication that raw data is following. In that case, we execute copy from input. The data we want to unpack is the input. So copy from input. Here we initialize a counter how much data to read and follow it up with reading two bits. If the two bits are a three, so in binary one one, we would add three to the counter and enter a loop to read the next two bits. But we only have a single byte to read, the single A, so we read two zero bits. They are later added to the counter, which was initialized with one, so one plus zero is one, which means we copy one byte from the input to the output. 
And so here we read the next 8 bit, which is that one byte, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 is the binary ASCII value for capital A. So we copy the single A to the output and we are done. Now let's check what happens with two A's. I'm switching back and forth between single and two A's and you can see here minor changes. First we see that the output decompressed size is now one zero, so a decimal two. And the two bits read for the input length is now a one. So one plus one is two. We read two bytes, two times eight bits. Now let's try three A's. Here's where it starts to get interesting. We read again the skipped byte, which is zero. Then we read the three bytes for the final output length, which is now one one, so three. And then we read the next bit, which is zero, indicating we have raw data again, so copy from input. We read the next two bits, which indicate the input length. Its default value is one, so one plus zero is one. So we read one raw byte, and that again is a single A. And that single A is the last A in the output. Now, let's check where the other two A's come from. After the copy from input, we now run into the copy from decoded. Decoded is basically the output. So here we are entering logic that copies data from the already outputted data. Makes sense, we want to copy the single A that we got. So first we read the compression level bits. No clue what that means. And if it would be 1, 1, we would have extra length data, but we read 0, 0. So that's not the case. And based on that info, we decide an amount of off bits to read. It takes from this offset bit length array, which is actually 7777, which you can find at the start of the compressed data. To be honest, I don't really understand its purpose. It's always seven. All I can say is that the copy length is minimum two. In our case, the amount of bytes we still need is exactly two. So the off value that we read is zero, which means we copy two bytes from the already decoded output. Here's the loop doing that. It copies the last A to the second last position, and then it copies the second last position to the third last, so the start of the string. And there we have our output. Now, this was rather inefficient. Our compressed data is so much longer than just single three A's, but let's try to compress a very long A string, 500 A's. Let's compress and uncompress. There we go. The compressed data is much shorter now. Like always, we start at the end, we have zero bits to skip, then we have the decompressed size, so this is binary for the 500 A's. Then we check if we have raw data, it's zero, so yes. Then we read the next two bits, they are zero, by default it's one, so one plus zero is the length of raw bytes we read, so one. The next eight bits are the byte we read, and that is the A again, zero, one, zero, 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 one. So we copy the very last A into the output. <sighs> Now it gets a bit more interesting in the copy from decode. First we read the two compression level bits, which are one, one, so a three, which means we have extra length data. Then we read another bit, which is zero, so we take the default optional bits small offset, which is also a seven. Again, no clue what's up with those sevens. All I know is we read the next seven offset bits and they are all zero, so no offsets but our compression level was binary one one, so a three. So we have three plus two, which sets the copy length to five. But of course we have a lot more A's to copy than just five. And this is indicated by the has extra length data. And here we have now a while loop where it always reads three bits and adds that value to the copy length. So three bits or ones would be a decimal seven. So as long as we read one one one, we add seven to the copy length. And in our compressed data, you can see a lot of ones. So it will find many of these three 111 packages and keep adding seven, plus seven, plus seven. It will add so many sevens that we eventually get close to the 499 copy length we need. As long as it's one on one, it will keep adding more. But eventually we read the binary 100. And that means we read the last value to add. We are done with the loop and our copy length is now 499. And then we have the same copy loop as before. We are copying 499 times the decoded output and we recover our 500 A's. So now you got a feeling for how compression algorithms might work. And all of this work is being done for this old game Frogger. I love nerds. As I introduced in the beginning, Kneesnap wrote this code for modding with Frog Tool, and he showed me some cool discoveries through that tool and how you can explore the levels and even modify them. Basically change the levels or maybe even make your own levels. 
I think he would be really excited if anybody would try to play around with Frogger and the modding tool and maybe share something on their forum. It's a small community, so there's space to make something nice. I'm also linking another video below where Kneesnap collaborated with another YouTuber where they are just exploring some interesting files and maps. If you are curious about this kind of data mining, it's highly entertaining. Thanks Kneesnap for making the internet just a little bit more awesome and of course all the other people involved in the Frogger community. I think this kind of work and community is what really inspires me to keep digging into computers and technologies. I'm doing it in my area of interest, CTFs and security, and they do it in old games. It's awesome. Some people might think that something like this is just a waste of time. But Kneesnap has gotten so much experience and skill from building such a tool, which will certainly help him in his career. And in the end, what they are doing is also hacking and reverse engineering. Just with a different goal. Not necessarily to break security, but to explore the mysteries of the imaginations you had as a child playing those levels. And I can relate to that. And that's why I want to explore Pokemon Red and Blue next.